came into the church as a teenager, about 15 years of age, made our trips to the uh, Big Sandy, Texas area for festivals and things like that. In the process of doing it, I met this interesting man. I saw him from a distance, actually, and observed him, but I heard people talking about him, and that man was Harold Jackson. Mr. Jackson was very humble, but he was also fearless. He was the kind of person who respected everybody, but feared no one. In the African-American community, or the black community in those days, as we were called, he was a giant figure. He probably stood about five foot five or something like that, but he was, he was, he was huge in the African-American community. He was a, a champion of the church. He really was. He loved the church. He loved what he was doing, and, and he loved all of the people. Uh, one of the things that Mr. Jackson provided was a bridge between the races because there was a certain amount of feelings there that had to be overcome. There were a lot of, it was, I guess, pre-civil rights, civil rights era. While very progressive in some ways, other, uh, other theological beliefs and philosophies uh, existed that really were hurtful and held uh, people of color back. One of them was not being able to attend the church's college, although you supported the church with, with tithes and offerings. Another was the ability to rise uh, in the organization in terms of uh, the level of service that you could provide and give. Uh, so in other words, if you, in those days, if you could not attend Ambassador College, your chances of being a minister, an ordained full-time minister in the Worldwide Church of God were slim and almost none. When the idea of an all-black church came up, and Mr. Jackson and Mr. Blackwell felt that this should be done because black leadership uh, potential was not allowed to develop. Blacks could not even be president of the Spokesman's Club at that time. The word was, well, no black man can be president of a, of a Spokesman's Club with white men in it. Now, there were certain people who were advocates for the uh, black community in those days, friends of the black community, you might say. And, and I, can't, I can't by any means name them all, uh, but I'll just name a few. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Herman Hay, Dr. and Mrs. Herman Hay, were always very gracious to people of color, in spite of whatever might be going on in the, in the, in the cities, villages, and towns. They were always very gracious encouraged education, encouraged uh, us to keep our heads up and to strive for the best and to, to be faithful. Um, Dean Blackwell and his wife, uh, just giants, uh, people that could see, had vision, could see past the limitations that society tended to put on us in those days and saw the African-American uh, community and, and the people in the, in the black community as people of great uh, ability potential. And by the way, in those days, the Worldwide Church of God was booming in terms of uh, people of color coming in. I mean, just, just everywhere and in every city, there were plenty of, of people of color coming into the Worldwide Church of God. Well, I asked Mr. Armstrong if it were possible for us to have Mr. Jackson move from the San Diego area as a deacon to the Chicago area to help. We had quite a burgeoning growth, especially in the black area on the south side. So on November the 21st, Mr. Armstrong ordained Harold Jackson in Pasadena, and immediately Mr. Jackson came to the Chicago area to assist in the growth there. And so we, he started the special classes, and we started going to them. And there were very rigorous examinations for us um, that he imposed. And it was an enjoyable experience, very challenging. People heard about this opportunity because they wanted to grow. They wanted to use their gifts in the service of the church and the kingdom. And so they came to Chicago to be trained under Mr. Harold Jackson. In 1961, I was given the, what I consider the tremendous opportunity to be hired as a ministerial trainee and to be sent to Chicago to work with Mr. Jackson. And Mr. Jackson was my trainer he was my coach, he was my teacher, he was my mentor, and in every way, he helped me to understand what it meant to be a minister. Interestingly enough, some of the members in Chicago once said, because I am about six feet tall, and Mr. Jackson was six, five feet six, 
they would look at us and say, well, here comes the long and the short of it. And he asked that I move to Chicago along with some other young black men who were graduating at the time. And I moved to Chicago and it was the best decision I'd made because Chicago offered so many things. The church, I had lived as an isolated Christian up until that time I was living in Alabama. There was no church for me to attend. Later on, they did establish churches there, but because of the racial situation, blacks could not attend church. Mr. Jackson's mission was to train young black men uh, to serve in the work because um, Ambassador College was not available for young black men because of certain racial policies in the church. And so, but at the same time, there was a need for men to go out and serve in the field, to baptize members, to counsel, and all this type of thing. It was a training place, Chicago. Respectfully, I say rigorous. He was a stickler for us, doing right, being educated, being uh, calm and precise. When we spoke, know what you're talking about. I often watched how careful he was to make sure that we did not make mistakes because the church was in the looking glass. He did not want us to be second to any, any church. And we were being scrutinized, South Side, West Side. First it was West Side, then South Side. And we, were all, we always had to, had to be 100% better than the other groups because we were being watched, we were being evaluated. Uh, everything that we did you know, it, it was subject to being reviewed, and if it didn't measure up, it might be over. He mentioned to a number of us, I want you guys to excel in scripture. I want you to be able to learn the doctrines. I expect as much from you as the white boys who are able to go to Ambassador. Don't use that as an excuse. Simply because you can't go to ambassador doesn't mean you can't learn the ways of God. As we went to the fall festivals in Big Sandy, Texas, many times all African Americans went to the same place. I thought it was kind of neat to have all the blacks go to one place and there were so many girls there and so many young guys and we had so much fun. We realized there was some Jim Crowism down there. Mr. Jackson, I remember him getting us on an old truck bed had a few leaders stand up with him. He stood on the bed, I wasn't on the bed of the truck, like a stage outside the big tent in Big Sandy, Texas. And he lectured us like a dad, like a father. Here's how you do this. When you go back to your home church, get involved in leadership, get in spokesman club, learn how to speak, become educated, make something of yourself, be valuable to society, be valuable to the church. Inside the church, there was, there was culture, especially in the Chicago South Side, but I think the influence was there in other areas also, that you learn to be dignified, uh, education was important, and um, you know, just learn to be the best that you can be. He taught us about etiquette. He taught us how to treat a girl. He taught us how to um, date and dance. When we had the, the singles, I think they called it the single social. In Big Sandy, it was very, um, very dignified, very elegant. And it was, it was really a high point. Even though I was in college, that was one of the most, uh, you know, dignified things that I got to attend is when we had those socials in, um, in Big Sandy. Well, he took me along on many visits, but I just would like to relate one I guess it's because I was new and he uh, didn't know what to expect. <laughs> so he said, now, Mr. Williamson, when we go in and we visit with these people, now I would just like for you to just watch and just observe and do not answer any questions. <laughs> no problem. I'm surprised he's taken me with him because I'm new. I, I've studied some, but I'm new and it was uh, really a good experience to see how he interact with people who uh, you know, are hungering and thirsting for uh, the understanding of the word as I was. When I applied to Ambassador College, though I was a contributor, I was, I, I was sent a very unfriendly letter, a letter that was really an insult. 
But I learned after, through Mr. Jackson's encouragement, that we had to look past things like that because obedience to God was above everything else and things would be corrected. Uh, black people believed that this was where God was working. Uh, felt encouraged by the fact that at least here was a church that acknowledged membership of blacks and whites and all other ethnic groups and, 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 and had a vision for what it would be in the future and really essentially looked past a lot of the things that we knew were inequities and wrong. And it, 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 it brought us a lot of grief in our own community, believe me, and among our families. And so we continued because we had this faith that God was working here and wanted to be a part of this. One of the biggest battles was the idea that blacks could not attend ambassador. And when Mr. Armstrong wanted to purchase some additional land, the city council of Pasadena put pressure on the college because one of the council members said, wait a minute, I'm not so sure we should do this because there's no blacks out there. What kind of people are those? So immediately a call came into Chicago in October that year to rush to young married black men to Ambassador College. We saw that, but the idea was always in the back of our minds because of his encouragement that God's in charge and eventually it's going to be corrected. In 1968, this is when uh, a number of us were accepted a, uh, to Ambassador College. And this is a crucial, um, I guess, uh, moment uh, in the history of the church. And of course, I think the prerequisite was you had to be married to be accepted. We were all uh, in this room, and I believe this was in Pasadena at the time. And Mr. Jackson was there and he, laid it on real thick to all of us how important it is for us to be at our top performance that we need to realize this is a golden opportunity to uh, to shine to you know to set the right example because you know this is the ambassador being open to to blacks being accepted uh, to ambassador so i mean it, that sort of kind of put pressure on 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 all of us at the time in 1970, the summer, late July, I was at work in Albany, and I got a phone call from Mr. Jackson. And he said, Ron, he said, they've just opened Ambassador College for African Americans, single. He said, I'd like to have you apply. I'd pretty much given up on the idea of college that is Ambassador College before, and so I'd been to NYU. But now I had the chance to go to Ambassador. And so on that foundation, I went. I came to Ambassador College as one of that first wave of single black students to attend. There were 10 of us, five girls and five boys. And this was mainly because of the, the church's held belief that at, at that time that you should not marry across the races. Now this, like some of the other things that were held as beliefs and, and, and theories in the church, was not held in the African American community largely. In other words, all, all 10 of us as single black students, respected the church's view on it. We would not violate it, but we never believed that that was God's stand on it. Uh, Paul talks in Romans about if you're stronger in a certain area, and we're all strong in some areas and weak in others, that you ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. And we looked at it as something that the church just didn't understand and that God was straightened out. And by the way, through all the uh, turmoil in America, and there, and there were some years of great turmoil between the races, and through all the, the complaints uh, that, that people of color had against the dominant group, Harold Jackson was a voice of calm and sanity, and a voice of reconciliation and of, of patience. He always said, this is God's church. If it's wrong, God will straighten it out. And it may not mean he was a pacifist. He would, he would advocate for the right position, but he knew just how to, to, to voice it enough and push enough, and then he knew when to, when to back off. And he was the right person for that time. Uh, I used to ask him about how it was to be, uh, to, to visit in the South, to, um, you know, 
how was it uh, to be able to visit the various uh, churches? And uh, he would uh, share with me some of the uh, difficult things he went through. Um, how it's an occasion. Uh, his uh, came very close to being arrested and put uh, put in jail. We knew we knew the church wasn't perfect. <laughs> okay, we knew the church had its uh, the church had its areas that it needed to to deal you know deal with certain issues. But Mr. Jackson, n knowing all that, was still committed and still faithful. He always had a sense of understanding and looking to the bigger picture. The picture larger than just the incident that's being involved. And I looked at his examples of how he, in order to help black people in the South, he agreed to drive as a chauffeur along with Mr. Ken Swisher so that blacks who were interested in the church, Mississippi and Alabama throughout the South could be uh, visited and there were people who laughed at the fact that well he's a he's a minister and here he is putting on a jacket driving as a chauffeur but he said it doesn't matter I'm helping people when I was a um, a senior an ambassador and at that time the head of church administration asked Mr. Jackson to come in and to talk about um, visiting out into the field ministry. And uh, Mr. Jackson began to speak about uh, uh, conditions out in the field ministry. Uh, he talked in terms about um, uh, you may run into uh, discrimination and things of that nature. Um, well, the head of church administration took him to task in front of the entire class I mean, it was embarrassing to me that he, he was handled that way in front of the entire class. Um, but what Mr. Jackson said was correct. There were put downs that we endured, but Mr. Jackson was there to encourage us and say, God is gonna correct it, don't worry about it. Remember what kind of society we live in, but remember who's in charge. God is in charge. Be patient. Those things that are wrong will eventually be corrected. He just taught us how, how to be leaders. And when he wanted to get really serious, and later on I became an elder, he would get all the elders in a hotel room. Kind of felt like Jesus, like the disciples when Jesus had been resurrected. And uh, we were all locked in a room so nobody could come in. Nobody could hear what we were saying. We would talk openly about the stuff we were experiencing. Some of it sounded almost like insurrection in the church but it really wasn't. He allowed us to go as far as we needed to go to express ourselves, get it all out, and then he would come back with, you've got to go back and do your job and realize this, this too will change, young man. This too will change, gentlemen and ladies. It's gonna change. And we kept going back over and over and over again and wondering, when is it going to start changing? But. It did change. He was respectful, but he held his ground and did what was best for the church. And so as a result of that, many men who otherwise would not have become leaders became leaders and faithful servants to the church. I was technically speaking the third pastor of the Chicago Southside Church. Uh, Carlos Perkins uh, was before me and then Mr. Jackson before him. When I got to Chicago Southside, it was so clear to me of Mr. Jackson's influence. And me being a uh, wet behind the ear uh, pastor, not knowing, you know, what I was doing, uh, I must say being, uh, being in that church was so helpful for me. He insisted on being a, a responsible adult, a responsible Christian, and conducting yourself like a lady or conducting yourself like a, like a gentleman. And, and you could see that in the church uh, when, I, when I got there. And even to this very day, that church is a, a, a really mature church.
So, but it, that was his influence. My wife and I have been here now for 23 years. There are kids that are in our congregation that were born since we came here and know no other pastor. Chicago, of all the places that we've been in, we found them to be people who speak their mind, uh, very honest, very frank, and consistent in, in, in the work that they do in volunteering in the church. And a number of them are involved in the community, whether they're serving on boards or re representing different community agencies. And to me, that's, that's ideal for uh, what we believe the, the, the direction that God is taking this church in. So as a young minister coming out, I was fortunate to be with Richard Frankel and Joyce Frankel. Both of us were with them in D.C. and they were, they were just excellent in terms of mentoring and teaching. We were there for what, seven years? I can't seven even years. remember. Because back then, you know, ministers, after seven years, they usually just pretty much moved you. So you know you were going to get moved. I had always uh, admired the work that was done in Chicago because Harold Jackson had done such tremendous work here. So when Mr. Blackwell and, and, uh, and Richard Frankel uh, recommended that we come to Chicago, it was, it was quite a, uh, an easy transition for us. And we came here in July of 1993 to pastor the South Church, a combination of the South Side and the Hammond Churches. Then we got the chance to share with the church in South Holland by the name of First Reformed Church, which was a glorious experience. We learned so much from them about what it means to own a facility and be in a facility and what it takes to do it. In the, in the transition from sharing with First Reform, we went through finding uh, our voice in terms of our mission statement, and we came to the name the Shepherd's Community Church of Illinois. And, and in part because we realized that God had given in this church a spirit of service, wanting to teach, wanting to mentor, wanting to invite people in and show them the way. And in this environment, we decided and determined that it was good to, to have a physical building. We went through searching out properties, and eventually God led us to a property here in, in Harvey. Um, we're in the early stages, we've only been here uh, three years, and much of that time has been consumed with actually preparing the place, um, purchasing, renovating, uh, getting it ready for use but also provide, provide help where help is needed, using our strengths to match them to the needs of the, com the community and to serve in that way. So I think that's like the next phase that we're gonna be going into with the new minister coming in. This Sunday we'll be having installation services for Kenneth Barker and his wife Lisa. And we just think that God has blessed us with a couple that has great potential for service in this area. We had a tour of the facility and we've seen a lot of the work that's been done here. And I can tell you from a spiritual perspective, the foundation is firm, <laughs> okay? From an economic perspective, the foundation is firm. And we just need to build upon that foundation that was developed early on. There's so much excitement, there's so much support, there's enthusiasm. Just in talking to some of the people yesterday, that, that passion is here for youth and for leadership development because we have a lot of counselors, we have a lot of educators, and they want to continue that and get out into the community. People saying, well, whatever you need, let me know, let's do this thing. And that's only the Holy Spirit because we can't do that. That's the Holy Spirit at work within everyone that's stirring them up to be ready to go. And we're right in the middle of a community that we're easily able to reach out and touch. So we're going to be going out and talking to people, knocking on doors, going over to the businesses and learning what do the people need. Yes, we have um, educational issues. Yes, we have economic issues. But people are going to experience the love of God when we sit next to their kids and we teach them to read. They're going to experience the love of God when we speak with them, right, about different things that's happening in their lives. This church here is going to be a beacon of light in the community, and the doors are going to be open. So um, I, I'm excited about it, and I'm, we're just ready to move. 